Thank you, Sean. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Leonard. I'm chairman of the Milton Board of Appeals. Today is uh, uh, Monday, March 21, uh, 2022, at 7 o'clock. And this is the uh, uh, scheduled hearing for 16 Amor Road uh, in Milton, Massachusetts. Uh, this is a uh, an application seeking to construct a 16-unit rental apartment development at 16 Amor Road, which is in a residence A zoning district. Uh, the property is located at the corner of Amor Road, Truman Parkway, Brush Hill Road, and is right across from the Neponset River in the city of Boston. Uh, the land area is approximately 40,349 40, square feet. Um, we uh, had opening uh, statements uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Shomer representing the, uh, the applicant. And a couple of weeks ago, we took a view of the uh, subject property for perhaps an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, this evening, uh, Mr. Shomer was going to begin his case in chief. Uh, and the subject matter for this particular uh, hearing is uh, uh, architecture and uh, perhaps some site issues as, as well. So, uh, uh, Mr. Schomer, if you're all set to go, well, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I am all set. Good evening. Good. Welcome back to the Board of Appeals. It's good to see you again. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Um, so just to update everyone, since the last time we were all together, uh, which I believe was all the way back on February the 2nd, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken about that. Um, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, there was the site walk held on February the 12th, and it I, I don't recall whether this came up at the site walk. Um, we may have mentioned it in passing, but of course everyone uh, who's on the call tonight uh, may not have been present for the site walk. Uh, but there was a meeting held the previous day with uh, with our team and the Milton Fire Chief, Chris Madden. And I, I don't recall, Sean, if you were on that call as well, if you may have been on the call. Um, it's, it's been a few weeks, but... Um, I vaguely recall it, but it could have been a different project. So they all run together. I think that's that partially our fault. Uh, so it, obviously, it's been a few weeks since we've all been together, and uh, we we presented the project. I guess I would I would say at a thirty thousand foot level, and our intent tonight is to hone in on some of the finer details with respect to the architecture and the layout. Uh, since then, we, as a, based on our meeting with uh, Chief Madden and, and some of the comments at the site walk, and we also did receive Sean's letter um, late last week, so we're, we're viewing that and, and processing uh, his recommendations, a, lo a lot of which lined up with Chief Madden's recommendations as well for, for recommended site modifications. Uh, my understanding is that Cliff Bomer's peer review letter has not yet come in. Uh, so we'll await that and uh, and review that once we once we have that. Um, but for tonight, um, I believe the lead presenter for architecture is going to be uh, Tim Loringer from Embark, as well as Jillian Tomaselli, also from Embark. Uh, and then follow up uh, with a presentation from Natalie Adams of Verdant Landscape Design. Um, Natalie has um, some greater details to share with the board, as well as some preliminary uh, plans which we have not filed formally yet with the board and they have to do with uh, photometric impacts and tree protections and the reason why we haven't filed them formally with the board is we're expecting them to change slightly if there are uh, site modifications based on the recommendations of the the fire chief and and mr reardon uh, so uh, natalie will be walking through those and we'll be happy to file them with the board uh, after tonight uh, to be followed up with more definitive versions in a, in a few weeks but we we did want to provide a a progress report, as it were, on those those topics to, to make sure everyone is aware that, that we're working on them and making forward progress. So uh, without any any uh, further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tim, um, if he could come on camera and, and take it away. Thanks, Jesse. Sorry, just uh, trying to get the camera going there. Uh, so yeah, I can go through a bit, a bit of a refresher from where the, the overall site plan stood, um, as well as a bit more detail um, on some some elements that have generally come up on on a few of these projects now that we've done. Uh, so just let me get my screen ready here, and with your permission, um, Chairman, I will should be sharing my screen. 
Thank you. That'd be great. So one thing that came up, um, I'd say repeatedly uh, over the course of the, the initial hearing and some, some of the preliminary comments and then at the site walk is the location of the site and its proximity. Um, so we wanted to go into a little bit more detail about um, it's the same to transit, same to some walkable amenities on the site. So uh, the next uh, few series of slides here kind of go into that. Um, let me share this presentation. Are you seeing my screen there? Not yet, sir. No, we just okay. have the, the uh, I'm sorry. entry screen. How about now? Is that full screen? No. Hmm. I'm, I'm seeing the title page for 16 Amor Road. I think you were successfully sharing a screen. I think. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> it's just the cover. It was just the cover page. Right, me, uh, one more time here. So now, are we seeing? Uh, yes. A two. <laughs> Awesome. Sorry about that. Great. So uh, this is showing a uh, the site here in the center with this blue arrow, um, a 10 to 15 minute walking radius um, taken from a from a source that we use to kind of create um, proximity. Uh, it's showing that we're basically within within uh, bikeable distances to both the Mattapan um, and Blue Hill uh, uh, Red Line trolley and MBT stations to the north, as well as the uh, Hyde Park. Uh, uh, Fairmount Station to the to the southwest, uh, and then kind of in more detail, it's a 1.2 miles or seven minute bike ride uh, to that Fairmount Station uh, down the Truman Parkway, where there is a bike lane on both sides of the road. Uh, in addition to the more protected bike path on the outside the guardrail, where I kind of we went over the um, the crossing that's a couple blocks north of our site um, with the with the single pedestrian crossing uh, at the previous meeting. Uh, and then to the north, that Mattapan station is uh, just under a mile, and again, about a seven-minute bike ride um, up Blue Hill Road, uh, Bush Hill Road, I mean, uh, and then Blue Hill Parkway. And then the 716 bus that runs up and down Blue Hill Ave uh, just is on the other side of Amber Road from where we are. So uh, um, under about a little over a quarter of a mile and a six-minute walk, which then brings you directly to Mattapan. Uh, so while there are not um, we're not necessarily in walking distance to uh, like downtown Milton or a lot of everyday um, like grocery amenities. We are very, there is a very transit uh, heavy presence in the site, whereas it is very bikeable to several different MBTA stations uh, and walkable to that, to that bus line. Um, and then from a walkability standpoint, uh, this again, same kind of vicinity map uh, showing a 10 to 15 minute this time walking radius. Um, one of the things I want to highlight here is that elementary school, because uh, the Blue Hills Parkway is basically within that within that range. Um, so the question of where kids will play on the site kind of came up at the last hearing. Uh, and the the Tuck Mountain Elementary School, which does have a playground. Uh, and I mean, I myself bring my kids to the, the, the elementary school that's down our street to use that playground because they prefer it to the spring set that's in our yard. Uh, it is about half a mile or a 10 minute walk. Uh, and then Kelly Field, which has a playground and open ball fields as well, uh, is a little bit further away um, uh, at about a mile. But uh, whether walking, biking, or just driving there and parking, uh, it is uh, an amenity within within Milton that is, uh, provides access to outdoor space that that would be within range of, of our site, as well as the the front of the, the kind of end of the deposit trail at uh, near the Madison Station. So these kind of this this easy accessibility to outdoor space is um, what makes Milton part of what makes Milton desirable. And uh, we think what what uh, one of the reasons we think that um, uh, additional affordable housing and housing in general um, is, is, is these sites were selected for that. Uh, and then kind of just a refresher for everyone on where we were on the site plan. Uh, so we're 16 units. Uh, the Here's the uh, Amber Road to the south here, Brush Hill to the, to the left, we're kind of at the intersection of the two roads. Uh, 16 units are a combination of townhouses and detached single family. Uh, so at the front of the site are the four detached single family homes, 
uh, to the rear are two groups of um, 12 townhouses for uh, six townhouses for 12 total townhouses with a total of 16 units. Uh, there would be two, uh, nine two bed units, three three bed units, and four four bed units. Those four beds are the uh, detached single family. Uh, and then there's 31 total parking spaces for a, a ratio of just under two. And each of the detached units has a, a covered garage space as well as a uh, like tandem um, driveway space, as well as uh, the 23 spaces that are uh, available for the for the 12 rear townhouses. And then here is just an axon view to kind of refresh everyone where we were. Um, this site access from the from Brush Hill Road, this emergency gated access that we're showing now, uh, was one of the topics of conversation in the uh, meeting with the fire chief. I think we can get in that uh, in a little more detail once we get to the the transportation, maybe. Um, but there's some some discussions on on altering that a bit to not have it be uh, a gated access, uh, but to revise that somewhat. Uh, but just looking at the homes here, uh, architecturally speaking, the idea was to uh, place the single family homes at the front of the site to kind of pick up on the 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 context and nature of Amber Road, where it's mostly detached single family, uh, all two stories. Uh, they have a um, kind of transitional. Uh, um, traditional materials, but kind of modern detailing, very clean, but still using a um, combination of board and batten and um, shingle siding uh, and sorry, clapboard siding. And then to the rear, we have a bit more modern uh, approach to townhouses. We're still using those uh, traditional materials, such as the, the shingle shake siding um, and fiber cement. We're doing so much more modern than what we're doing at the, at the detached single family. So kind of two approaches um, on different halves of the site. And then uh, last thing I kind of want to get into here is just um, a refresher of the of the overall site plan, kind of zooming in a little more. We had um, highlighted areas for bike parking um, kind of in each end of the site, uh, as well as trash enclosure and the mechanical equipment. Uh, because these are not a um, consolidated uh, unit type, it's more of a spread out unit type with the, with the pitch roofs. You don't have a, a flat roof with like a shared stair with roof access, we won't be placing the mechanical equipment on the roof, um, they will be kind of scattered around the site. Uh, so kind of showing that in more detail, here's just an example of what those condensers would look like. Um, they're really the same as you'd see in any other single family home. Um, they're about two and a half feet wide, by like two and a half feet deep and a couple of feet tall. Um, and they're actually probably a little bit smaller capacity wise than what you see in a typical single family uh, because these units are smaller than the typical, the typical detached home. Um, and they're very efficient and uh, the modern ones are quite quiet. We'd additionally be screening them with vegetation as well as the fencing at the, at the perimeter of the site. Um, also on the slide, uh, just an example of uh, the bike parking we're gonna be uh, including, because again, this isn't a kind of consolidated building type. Um, we don't have a uh, single central um, interior uh, bike storage area. It's, we're gonna be kind of scattering them around the site. Um, and then the detached homes have, have space within their garages um, that could be used as storage as well. Uh, and in terms of uh, trash storage and pickup, uh, based on the unit count and um, the EPA's uh, kind of standard metrics, we estimate that either a pair of four cubic yard dumpsters or a single six cubic yard dumpster um, will be uh, more than adequate for the site. Um, and here's a showing example of how big that four cubic yard dumpster is. It's about three feet deep, six feet wide, and four feet tall. Uh, six cubic yards would be the same width, a little bit taller. Um, and there, there's that the dumpster enclosure location we're showing is, is nearly 15 feet wide. So um, ample space for a dumpster that can be easily accessible off of that drive out here. Uh, and then we can screen that with some fencing to kind of hide it from view. And I went too far, I'm sorry. Uh, Final thing I want to review is just uh, there were a couple of questions that came up about uh, sustainability and energy efficiency. Uh, so because Milton is a stretch code community, um, it means we will have to get a, meet a certain HERS rating of 55. Uh, and the way the HERS index works uh, is a standard new construction home is gets a score of 100 as a kind of reference point. A net zero home is zero. So the lower the score, the more energy efficient. A score of 55 means you would have to be 45% more efficient than uh, standard new construction. Uh, and for an additional reference uh, point, uh, your typical existing um, um, home stock is in the 130 to 140 range. 
Uh, so significantly more more efficient than than your typical um, existing home, as well as your typical new construction. Um, and then ways that you would meet that energy efficiency is just uh, through the wall and roof assembly, having uh, proper insulation levels, reducing uh, air leakage uh, to, to cut down on infiltration and exfiltration, um, having low U factor on your door window glazing, having uh, energy efficient HVAT systems and water heaters, as well as energy star rating appliances, uh, LEDs for the interior and exterior lighting, as well as programmable thermostats, um, smart thermostats, uh, and where, where applicable in some of the flatter portions of the roof that aren't shingles, we would be using a lighter roof material to cut down on heat gain. Um, so with that, uh, that's kind of the, the, the additional architectural details we have at the moment. Uh, I can answer some questions. We can go back. Um, I think it might make more sense, um, Mr. Chairman, if we kind of finish off the presentation here with the slides that we have showing the site lighting as well as the tree protection plan that our landscape architect will go over. And then from there, maybe we can um, um, build some questions. That sounds fine. Go ahead. All right. Great. So I can keep sharing my screen and we can um, bring on Natalie Adams from Verdant uh, Landscape Architecture. That's uh, great. You can walk you through. And let me know when you want to advance the slides. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair and members of the board. I'm Natalie Adams. I'm with Verdant Landscape Architecture. Can everybody hear me? Very well. Great, thank you. Um, so this you're looking at is uh, is the lighting plan, and we um, we're following all the lighting standards from the town. Um, no light trespass to the neighbors, and um, dark sky compliant lights. And you'll notice if you can zoom in on that plan a little bit, Tim, so we can get a better look at just what we're looking at. Oops. Um, oh. yeah, I'm gonna. Uh... <laughs> That's okay. So at each entry, um, at the front entry and um, of of the townhouses and the uh, um, the front entry of the single family dwellings, we have um, small porch lights to light up um, each individual door. Um, you'll note those are at the uh, the front entries and the rear entries, and you'll also note the larger vehicular lights these aren't very tall like you might see in a big parking lot these only go up to about 16 feet and they are um, just enough for safety in that parking area and that's and we also have one at the entry um at our at amor road um so it's it's you know we we never want to over we never want to overlight anything so we're really staying with the low light um standards and next page please tim um, and this, of course, if you look into this, you'll see some of the uh, series of lights that our lighting rep, and there's their name, um, uh, has chosen for this site. Um, uh, very uh, simple, energy efficient, clean, dark sky compliant, et cetera. So if anyone's interested, they can look into that. There it is. Next page, please, Tim. Okay, now this is our tree preservation plan. Um, and what we were asked to do um, was to um, go out and do a site analysis survey of the trees, uh, any tree from the property line, 20 feet outside the property line, and also including the trees on the property we wanted to preserve. So Tim, I'm, gonna, I'm testing you tonight. I want you to start at the northern, um, property line on Brush Hill. There's a large tree over there. That's why I want to start there and I want to walk clockwise around the site. So if we start up there at that corner, um, you'll note that this is a 24 inch diameter at breast height. That's what DBH stands for. And that's an oak tree. So that's a nice big oak tree we'd like to save. And it's and it's part of our purview as doing these 40 B developments is to pre preserve these significant trees along the property line to, to help mitigate with the neighbors. So we're saving that one. Now, as we go, um, to screen right, you'll see that the neighbors there above us on Brush Hill have just lawn and then their asphalt driveway. And then we start to get into this forest environment as the hill rises a bit. And you'll see some hatching there within the property line. That's a rock outcropping. And um, I really noted anything eight inches or larger. So, you know, we have a forest back there, but, um, you know, forests are funny creatures there. Um, 
they're populated in many different ways, but so close to the property line, we have an eight inch diameter, a 10 inch diameter. We have a big 22 inch diameter oak and then a 17 inch diameter. And then as we go around the site, um, it starts to get um, really populated, very close trees. And, um, you know, I denoted all of these, uh, I noted all of these 15, 18, 18, 18, eight and 28. Um, a, many of them have storm damage and um, there's a cute little beech tree there that's got really bad storm damage. But um, I denoted that I noted them all. And then that last bit towards Amher Road is just full of invasive plants and um, and you know that's uh, that's that's an issue right there. And so this page shows um, the tree preservation plan. And if we go around down to the end of Amar Road, down to the corner of Amar and Brush Hill, you see there's a large group of trees there that we're preserving. Um, there's a nice big 24 inch diameter um, uh, oak, an 11 inch oak, and another nine inch oak. So we're going to protect those, and we're protecting their root zones. And um, and if we zoom out, if we zoom out a bit, you'll see our details for um, protect how it how we're going to protect these trees, what kind of fence we're going to use, what kind of signage we're going to have, how the landscape architect is going to walk the property with the contractor before site work start, and they're going to talk about how the fence is going to go and where it's going to go and how the trees are going to be saved. So that's all outlined in the uh, text right there. Um, Tim, do you have anything else you want me to present tonight? Do you want me to go over the site plan as well, or are you just going these, uh, the lighting plan and the tree preservation plan? I believe we were sharing the kind of the new information that was added since the last Okay, time. I understand. All right, thank you very much. I do have the other stuff I need to queue up. Um, oh, okay. You know, there's one more plan. I think there might be one more plan here is the uh, tree preservation plan, and this is with the development uh, overlaid on top of it. And and I didn't present just this because as, as you can see, when you start looking at it, it gets really complicated. And I wanted everyone to be aware of uh, the work we've done. But this is uh, with the development footprint on there, with all the trees, all the surrounding trees and all our protected trees. What do you want me to present next? Turn the page out. I'll, I'll talk about. It. <laughs> yeah, Tim, could you go back to the uh, the main landscape plan uh, to have Natalie go through that? Thank you. Here it comes. Here it is. So this is our uh, landscape plan. And Tim, if you could zoom in to the entry drive, that's where I'd like to start right there. And, and I'm going to go um, clockwise down um, the single families. So right here um, at Amore Road, we decided to put the entry drive here at the site because the Brush Hill is just, it gets very busy and it's, it's just not safe for traffic to be coming in and out of there. So I think this was a very good decision to put it up here on the site. And we have a nice line of um, Arbor Vitae there to help mitigate the neighbors, our, our next door neighbors on our Moore Road. And as we move down, and I'm going to do the um, the public realm first along our Moore, and then I'm going to do the parking court. So in front of these single family dwellings, um, we're proposing um, red oaks, and those are the deciduous trees there, the sidewalk, and, um, and we're also proposing white pines. And so you have this mixture of evergreen and deciduous, which is going to carry you, you know, shade in the summer. And this is really going to contribute to the public realm because these trees, you know, all up and down Amore Road, it was, the development was done during the 50s and 60s when it was, you know, they were embracing lawn and they were um, going without street trees. So we're really adding to the street tree public realm. And as we, um, you'll also note that in front of each dwelling unit, I have um, uh, uh, Ilex uh, galabra, which is a uh, broadleaf evergreen shrub. So that's going to carry throughout um, the you know spring, summer, fall, and winter. It's it's uh, a beautiful. Now in between each of those dwellings, I'm proposing um, 
a rhododendron um, maximum, which are rose bay rhododendrons. So these again are broadleaf evergreens. All these plants are native, and um, I've kind of split them off so that there's two on one side and two on the other side. So we have an access between the dwellings, um, but we we have a buffer from the street where you wouldn't be able to see through it there. So that was my thinking on there. Now, if we just continue down to where those preserved trees are, we're um, also adding white pines into this uh, mix of existing trees. And, um, I, you know, I think with the deciduous plant material, it's really great to have deciduous, but it's always good to have evergreen plant materials. And the white pine is part of the uh, oak forest environment, which is part of, you know, what's all over Massachusetts. Um, now I'm going to do the parking court in the middle is my next uh, presentation. So here we have uh, the parking court, which, you know, is a nice long um, row of stalls. And we really wanted to break that up. So we've put um, a couple of islands in there. And here between those islands and the sides and then the ones in front, front of the uh, single family dwellings, dwellings, there's a mixture of plane tree and um, Acer saccharum, which is a uh, red maple. So you're gonna get the, the plane tree has this beautiful exfoliating bark. And then the, um, the red maple has this, you know, beautiful fall foliage. So you'll get uh, both of those. There you go. And um, what else do I have to say about that? Oh, I'm also proposing um, ornamental grasses in the parking islands. And this is to really give um, give some relief during the summer months, but then during the winter, they cut them down and you can use it for um, so storage if you, if you need to. And then at the, um, the patios for the single family dwellings, there's a little wall there at the single family dwellings and there's pervious pavers at the patios, which is part of our eco gardening principles. And then we have some nice ground covers that offer a little um, buffer between, you know, your patio and the parking court. Now, as we are looking at the townhouses, we have a nice, um, a nice perennial and shrub border in front of each little townhouse unit. And they're all a little different. They're not quite the same. So it's it's a nice mix. It's a nice blend. They're, they're, all, they're all of that scale. We didn't want to use anything too large in these little beds. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Now, as we go back into the rear of the townhouses, we're also showing pervious pavers um, at the patios back there. And, um, and they have a little wall around them. And then we're showing um, Calmia latifolia and uh, Pieris floribunda, that's mountain laurel and uh, mountain andromeda. And they're both broadleaf evergreens and the Calmia and Pieris both have these beautiful flowers in either um, May or June. And then behind them, we're showing a mixture of um, pine and um, what else did I have in there? Uh, rhododendron, I think, and um, and that's to buffer the neighbor to the north of us on Brush Hill Road. And then just for the last bit, I'd like to address the neighbor on Amore Road. So if you could just go over to screen right, um, we are, you know, as I said, um, we have those nice arborvitaes right there by that drive. And then we have some two large um, deciduous trees right there. And then underneath the deciduous trees, I've um, proposed um, Aeschylus parviflora, which is bottle brush buckeye, which is this wonderful native plant that um, grows in any kind of light. And it just, it really fills in. I think it'll be a really beautiful buffer. And now our design concepts, um, you know, for this whole development are an eco-friendly country garden. So we're really trying to make it um, ecological and um, with a little country flair to it, a really la relaxed style. Um, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Do you have anyone else you want to introduce as a part of your testimony? I believe that's that's it for us tonight. Unless Tim, unless you have uh, additional slides you'd like to go through. Um, that's it for kind of additional information. I don't know if you want me to rehash any of the any of this architectural slides from the original presentation. Um, I mean, I put in the I kind of went over the site plan and overall um, rendering again, but I don't know if you want to go into more detail on any of the other information. Uh, Mr. Leonard, would that be helpful to, to have Tim run through the, the details, the materials, and 
elevations of the of the proposed buildings. Well, why why don't we? And we'll have a you know, complete record at the same time. So I, I don't think that should take very long. But uh, go ahead, Tim. Why don't you? No, sure. So yeah, so here just on the screen now, we're looking at the original um, kind of aerial rendering we were we were looking at previously. Um, uh, and then the overall site plan again here. So as Natalie noted, we um, our site access is from uh, the kind of southeast of the site on off of Hammer Road, uh, and that's both the uh, uh, access and egress for for everyday vehicles with the with the emergency access only onto uh, Prussia Road. So the the units themselves are all two stories. Um, so the detached single family at the front, and then the townhouses at the rear. Uh, something that had come up a few times in the site walk that I think was was uh, kind of lost in translation a bit is we only have the one curb cut on the site. So all of the garages for the single family homes are accessed from that center drive aisle. Uh, Ammer Road itself, we are extending the, uh, there's no current sidewalk on Ammer Road, um, but the sidewalk from Brush Hill Road that terminates at the corner, we are wrapping that around the border and extending it down to provide that direct pedestrian access. Um, to the front doors of each of the, the single family homes, uh, but curb cut kind of vehicle access itself will be from the rear. Uh, we're not adding any more curb cuts to, to Amber Road itself. Uh, and then this showing the second floor here, uh, you can see that the typical width of the townhouse is about 16 feet, uh, 22 feet where we have the, the three bedroom, the, the 16 feet are the, are the smaller two bedroom ones. Uh, there's a 13 foot, um, Set back to the rear, which Natalie noted, we have the, the small patio spaces for each townhouse as it's some private outdoor space. Uh, there will be the condenser back there, which then will be screened in by some vegetation and then uh, a consistent row of vegetation uh, along the rear between the property line and the edge of the patios, uh, which themselves um, are separated from by a bit of a retaining wall. We can get into that uh, in one of the sections in a, in a moment. Uh, this section is taken, if you can look at the key here, uh, same orientation as the plan, we're cutting through the rear townhouses. Uh, there's a fairly significant grade change from Brush Hill Road um, as you work your way kind of down Amher. Um, so the townhouse typology allows us to, to kind of step up the hill without doing anything, um, any major excavation or, or grading changes. Um, and as we reach the top, um, we did, uh, the, the site kind of slopes up naturally fairly quickly and then levels off because that's where the current existing home is kind of at the center of the site. Uh, so the changes, the one change we are making is we're kind of making that a, a little bit more gradual grade um, to kind of keep it as a, at a, at a percentage that we're comfortable with for the parking. Um, so the result you see from that here is once you meet the property line, there is a bit of retaining wall between that, that um, kind of southeastern most unit. Uh, and the existing grade. So the unit, the while the townhouse itself, we're not we're not seeing the full height of that from from the abutter at 28 Amber Road. Um, it's only about 19 feet eight inches to the edge of the eave, and then 25 feet to the to the ridge line. Um, and I can go over the height um, of all the units uh, a little bit more um, detail in a few slides. Uh, these are still the kind of the overall sections. Uh, so this section again, cutting through the opposite way now. So we're going across sections of the site. So Amber Road is on our right. Uh, the abutter at 220 Brush Hill here to the left. Uh, and then this is that area of the patios I was mentioning where there is, a, again, for the same reason where we're kind of, we're, we're cutting into the site a little bit to, to even out the grading. Uh, that results in the patios being a few feet below the existing grade, which just creates a, um, another level of separation between the abutters and um, any activity on those patios uh, and creates the same effect where, where it results in um, a, less, a, a lesser perceived height of, of the buildings themselves. And then I think overall from, from this from this view, you can take away that we're we're fairly in line with the existing context. And again, you can see the, the abutter to the to the adjacent to us on Amber Road in the distance here is comparable to the height of the single family homes, which are comparable to the height of the of the abutter across the street at 17 Amber. Uh, and the townhouses are intentionally a little bit smaller than those um, as we're at the rear of the site, closer to the butter at 220 Brush Hill. Um, and then as I had, I had previously mentioned, um, there's there's two, uh, we're taking two different aesthetic approaches to the two building types uh, with the single family homes being a bit more traditional, a bit more kind of tradition, uh, transitional farmhouse, um, kind of in line with what we're doing with, uh, with Natalie's landscape design. 
that kind of that country feel. Uh, so we're just showing some examples here of some some super clean board and batten um, and uh, clapboard with um, that kind of expressed the gable and some strong horizontal elements that kind of split that up in these porches. And then you can see in the elevations um, those motifs we're kind of picking up on. Uh, and here's just some thumbnails of these materials. Uh, so the overall height of the uh, detached homes is uh, about just under 32 feet at the max, uh, but that's always taken from the kind of lower end of the of the of the the building because as we're stepping up the hill, there's always the, the lower end on the um, the garage sides on the higher end to work, get the gradient to work out. Uh, so the buildings themselves are about 27 feet from average grade, and then a few extra feet from that from that low end, and that's to the ridge line. Um, they're, they're, what's perceived as the height from the kind of E will be much lower and again in line with the two story with the gable roof that you that you're generally getting on Amber Road. And then for that for those townhouses, um, a, a more modern approach where we're still using these kind of traditional fiber cement shaped materials uh, kind of illustrated here. These are some examples from uh, actual cedar. Um, and uh, we're just kind of trying to as you can see, something else here is showing uh, it's, there's some framing elements around these larger, more modern windows we have um, in kind of ways we can detail that in a modern manner um, that we think is is elegant and a, and a nice solution for these for these units um, while still um, highlighting that gable form that that connects it to what's happening at the single family uh, at the front of the site. So again, here is just that uh, the elevation of the of the rear townhouses. So again, the um, a little bit taller on the low end, um, 31 feet is the is the max height measured from. This is never ever going to be perceived this way, but the way that uh, the the zoning code kind of calls for the height to be measured uh, is you take it from the ridge of the roof at the highest point of the building, measured from the lowest point of the grade, which is 31 feet. But in reality, the highest it's ever really going to feel is 27 feet, um, which is that ridge line to the adjacent grade. And then it'll be perceived even less than that um, from the eaves of the, of the units themselves. Uh, and then this is the, um, the second group of uh, two-story townhouses to the right, where we start to introduce some wider units to get those three bed units in. Um, the, the, the base of the building will be this kind of dark clapboard. Um, and then these gable forms that protrude a little bit um, and create an overhang uh, will be that, that shingle siding um, with a cedar socket beneath. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of recess at each door. Uh, so here's the rendering from the corner. This is Amber Road here and Brush Hill on your left. Uh, kind of ghosted in is those existing trees that we're maintaining just to kind of get a sense of the scale of those units. Uh, and you can see the single family home stepping up the hill. Uh, and then this is from the other side. So this is the other end of Amor. You see the um, site entrance here. And again, ghosted in is the um, site fence that we're adding. Uh, so you wouldn't actually see uh, any of the rear units from this view. We just wanted to show it in scale how that would relate. Uh, and I think you get a good sense of the activity that's provided along the street by extending that curb and providing that front entry to each one of those units. Uh, and then the last thing that we can, uh, I'll, I'll go over here, um, is just to kind of show again the, the shadow studies that we prepared. Uh, so what you're looking at here is an overlay of uh, shadows taken every hour throughout the day. Um, so where it's darker is where there's an overlay, um, where, the, where there'll be shadow for longer duration. Um, so this is so, showing the summer solstice and uh, due north is kind of to the top left of the screen here. So this is on June 21st where sunrise would be just after 5 a.m. and sunset. Sunset is just before 8.30. So you get 15 hours plus of total daylight. Uh, but because the sun is at such a high angle, there's very minimal um, kind of shadow spill onto the onto the neighbors or affecting the neighbors. Um, for instance, at at noon on summer solstice, a 30 foot building or a 30 foot object would cast a shadow of only 10 feet. Um, so that's generally what you're seeing here, uh, with uh, directly due north in sight. There's almost no um, shadow spill over from those buildings. Where you're seeing these deeper shadows to the east and west. Uh, is where the, the sun is at the lowest point in the horizon at dawn and at dusk. And this orange line here represents the sun path of the day. So you can see we're very, um, 
we're very it gets very north of east and west uh, on the horizon at this during the solstice. And then looking at the uh, March and September equinox, you have about equal uh, amount of just about 12 hours of sunlight. Um, a little bit more effect to the north. Um, you're not getting as far on the horizon. You're kind of uh, just rising due east, setting due west. Um, so those east-west shadows aren't as deep. You're having a little bit uh, deeper uh, shadow to the north, but still uh, only slightly encroaching along the property um, adjacent to us at 220 Brush Hill. And you, you can, this is all modeled three-dimensionally, so you can see the roof line of that property isn't impacted by the shadows. You can actually see the chimney here creates a shadow on the roof, so you can see the, the difference between our shadows and kind of what's existing. So these are, none of this would have a, a noticeable impact. And then to the to the south, um, to the abutters on Amber Road, uh, there'd be zero shadow impact. And then looking at the winter solstice on December 21st, where there's only uh, about nine hours of sunlight, um, the the um, sun path uh, barely gets to the to the east or west, so almost all impact is toward the north. There's really nothing again to the to the south here on Amber Road, um, and you're creating some pretty deep uh, winter shadows at the. Um, but then again, I mean everything on December 21st is creating some pretty deep shadows, uh, including all the existing vegetation that is between our property um, and the abutters property. But again, you can see that the there's minimal impact on the roof line, showing that because we're not higher, we're not really, um, we're not casting a shadow over the house. It's really just onto the, in the front of the yard. Uh, so that uh, kind of wraps up what we have for architectural slides. Um, I, can, I can give it back to you, Jesse, if you want to. Great, thank you very much, Tim. Um, Mr. Chair, that I believe concludes our presentation for this evening. Um, as Tim mentioned in, in his remarks, one of the items that we are currently studying is the, uh, the secondary uh, access point on Brush Hill Road, which is currently proposed as a gated access point, as Tim is showing there with his cursor. Uh, in our meeting with Chief Madden, and this was also mentioned in, in Sean's comment letter uh, received last week, there was an ask that we provide uh, access here without a gated entry point uh, to allow for fire vehicles to enter the site at this location. So that's currently some, something that we're studying to make sure that it's laid out properly um, and, and safely so that the vehicles can access the site from, from that location, as well as to have appropriate traffic calming measures within the site uh, to make sure the vehicles coming in from that, that approach are, are uh, adequately uh, slowed when they, when they get in onto the site itself. Uh, the other open item that we're currently investigating, and this is this is being looked into by our traffic consultants, MDM Transportation, uh, there was some, some discussion at the site walk of the feasibility of providing a pedestrian access across Brush Hill Road uh, to, to, to access the, uh, the walking and, and biking trails across, uh, across the, the road there at the Neponset Reservation. Uh, that's that's also something that that's under study currently, and and I believe that MDM has uh, some updated information. Um, so hopefully by the next time we're before this board, uh, we'll have an update to provide you on those. Uh, but that's the status of the project at this point. Um, so we'll we'll hand it back to you, Mr. Chair, and we'd love to have any any feedback or questions. Uh, we're we're available. Great. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Shulmer, and uh, thanks, Tim and Natalie. I think this has been very helpful and very well presented. I'd normally go to the board members for questions, but I, I think in this particular instance, since we were dealing with a lot of engineering and technical stuff, uh, it may be preferable uh, to uh, see if uh, Sean Reardon uh, has any questions of uh, either Tim, Natalie, or uh, Mr. Shomer. Uh, sure, I've got several. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, first, I'm just a little unsettled by sort of the minimization of certain things. So I just just I, I just be cautious in sort of the rosy presentation of information. Um, it certainly spins it in a positive direction, which I, I, I don't necessarily share. So um, first quick couple quick questions are so so there's a proposal to save that 24 inch oak tree at the north, I guess it would be northwest corner. But yet there's electric lines, a sewer line, and an electric transformer proposed in that same location. H how do you propose reconciling those potential conflicts? 
<laughs> Natalie, were you able to address that one? Those are um, placed by the civil. I would um, I would ask them to see if they could adjust it. Okay. Because well, I was uh, I was a little concerned that I mean I I've been pressuring them to scoot it out of the way uh, for a bit now. So yeah, I think I think we could move it. Well, well, the issue is there's no other place to put it. So um, if you know there's no room at the front of the building for it because the all the other utilities are there and the and the infiltration systems are there. So you know this speaks to the issue at hand from our perspective is that the site is so developed there are no other places to put anything than they're currently shown. There's no spillover area. There's no other things. So it's going to put a premium on every one of these little details because the presentation I heard tonight says a lot of things are possible when, when they may not in fact be. Um, so another quick question too. Um, can we show the landscape plan real quick? So the question I have here is this, the trees in the parking lot. The canopy is shown shading over the parking area. And, and the way I understand it is usually the root balls are the same size as the canopy. Um, if that's in fact the case, these root balls would be extending into the infiltration system because basically every square inch of pavement has an infiltration system underneath it. So, you know, I don't know if these street trees are going to have to get you know, reconsidered for what will fit in that physical space. But can you speak to that at all? I, um, I've run into something similar on a, another similar project and they were um, proposing tree boxes for the trees, which I'm, I'm on the fence a little bit about. I think, you know, if you, if you, pant, if you, I mean, these are going to be big trees. They're, uh, they're, plane trees and well, those are plane trees. Those two we're looking at right now. Um, so they're going to get fairly large and we want them large to shade the, um, the paving. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm at a little bit of a, I'm, a, I'm struggling between, you know, do we, we choose a tr smaller tree with a smaller root ball with less shade or, um, or put the larger trees in a tree box and just see how big they can grow. Okay. So, so what you're saying is there's, there's probably not enough space to, to, to see the full potential of these trees that you've selected. Right. Okay. And then another quick question is, is there a reason why there's no sidewalk connection from Amor Road into the site? I think there is. Um, Oh, Amor Road. No. Yep. Um, there isn't an existing sidewalk on Amor Road. Um, but you're, you're building one. So I think the idea is that, let me bring back to you. Okay. Uh, the idea is that the road on Brush, the sidewalk on Brush would extend around to connect to these units, but there wouldn't be anyone coming from the south down Amor because there isn't an existing sidewalk. But I guess we can look at kind of wrapping that continuously around. To, to create that full connection. Um, we would imagine most of the of the um, uh, pedestrian and kind of bike traffic would come from Brush Hill where we're showing the connection here. Uh, so this is really more more um, dedicated, not dedicated, but it, it's given more to kind of create that streetscape uh, presence and to provide access to those units um, more so than to feed anything coming the other way down the camera. Um, right. But we can look at wrapping that through. And kind of creating that full connection on both sides of the site. All right. And then and how deep are the driveways at the units along Amor Road? I don't know the um width off the top of my head, but they're they're over 20 feet. The width yes, of the depth, that? sorry, sorry, the, the width of the depth, did you mention? The, the depth. Uh the, the depth, depth are, I believe they're about 20 feet. They're so they look they look shorter than the stalls across from them. John, they're 18. This is Paul with Allen and Major Associates. The driveway okay. depths are 18 okay. feet and the width is 11 feet. Thank you, Paul. So, so, in a, so, so those are shorter, a foot shorter than a standard stall. That's correct. As measured from the curb line to the door. Correct. So no allowance for bumper overhang that would traditionally be in a parking spot. So you think you're not going to have any vehicles with their 
bumper sticking out into the drive aisle. So we'll evaluate that and uh, see what we could do. Yes, I mean, so you're seeing a common thread in all my comments here. So, so, so we've got all these issues that, that they all have a common solution, which is you need more space, but there's no space to give on any of them. So I think you gotta you know, look at all these things and come up with a strategy for you know, how these comments are going to be addressed because I, I, you know, I, I'm pretty creative and I don't see any solutions. So, um, yeah, in, in we can get even further into the, you know, how do you get rid of snow in the back of the, the, the townhouse units when you're four feet down and you're going to get snow blowing in. So I, yeah, good luck opening that door in a snowstorm. Um, you know, it's just the, the common element is that we've got, we've got really no space. Um, and yeah, I know there's a, 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 a elementary school, you know, a quarter of a mile or a half a mile away, but, you know, there's still nothing left on site where, where people can, you know, with the exception of that small space out near Brush Hill Road, there's really just not much space anywhere. Even the space that's along Ama Road is mostly in the public right-of-way. So just, you know, that, that's where, that's where, that's where my questions are going to be coming from. And, and I'm probably not going to give up too easily on any of them. I think John, that's that's enough for me for now. Okay, that that's that's great. Uh, nobody uh, uh, anticipates you're giving up on anything either, but we appreciate that. Uh, these are great introductory uh, comments, and it'll give the applicant uh, some uh, uh, some interesting homework. Uh, oh, actually, what one more quick thing that I think is a, a, a pretty big issue too is the grade on the sidewalk along the front of the townhouses is five percent. That, that's that's the maximum allowable running slope of an ADA accessible route. So any sort of deviation from that 5% below it means that it's going to have to deviate higher somewhere else. So again, we've got another situation with, you know, we've got the maximum allowed with no flexibility. We even got a parking and handicap spot shown outside of a unit with a staircase. So you know, just all these things is, are things that cause me concern because I just don't see any tenable solutions for them. Great, thank you, Sean. Appreciate it very much. Uh, why don't we go to uh, the board members and see if they have any uh, uh, questions of uh, Mr. Lawrence here uh, or, or with uh, Natalie Adams. Um, Mr. Brian Conley, do you want to be heard? Sure, Mr. Chairman, although I, I see Mr. Zawinski's hand up, I'd, I'd love to hear what questions or comments he might have. Okay, great. That that's a great idea. I obviously uh, I, I don't have a control program in front of me, so I don't know who has the hand up. So thanks for pointing that out, uh, Mr. Zawinski. Do you want to uh, uh, participate at this stage of the uh, presentation? Uh, uh, certainly, Mr. Chair, and 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 thank you, Mr. Connolly, for for seeding uh, the beginning of your uh, your your remarks. I, I don't have a ton. Um, I think that Sean uh, raised a lot of really important points. Um, but but I but I think the my the point that I wanted to make I think is of a piece with his comments about sort of the the, the space on this site. So um, I, I appreciate the move towards um, providing on-site uh, bicycle parking. I know the uh, the single-family houses are obviously going to have a lot more flexibility in terms of storing whatever type of vehicle <laughs> you want to store inside the house. It's it's the townhouses that I'm concerned with, and I think this is really important because. You know, if you can if you can manage some type of a safe crossing across Brush Hill Road, um, that's that's not a bad ride to Fairmount, and 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 in fact, I would actually say it's probably quite a good ride. Um, and so I, I I think you know as we talk about how do we how do we mitigate the impacts of traffic, how do we mitigate all sorts of other kind of impacts of this project. Um, I think this is a credible project where, you know, you could get people, you know, to get on their bikes and get to, to the Fairmount line or, you know, out to Mattapan Square, which is a little bit longer. But I mean, that Fairmount, you know, station is seven minutes away. The vast majority of it is on a great separated, you know, bike trail. Um, people will do that. Um, but they have to have somewhere to store their bike. <laughs> um, you know, you're not going to have a bicycle commuter, you know, leaving their, 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 their means of conveyance, you know, outside, um, unprotected, you know, for the elements all year round. And so, you know, we don't tend to pay a ton of attention to the uh, the floor plans and 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 kind of the interiors of these spaces. 
Um, you know, we don't often get sort of townhouse treatments in these projects. We're usually dealing with larger kind of multifamily buildings. But I think you really do need to be deliberate and um, intentional about providing some type of space that can, again, credibly be, you know, labeled as a, as a bike storage space because um, people will do it if you give them the, the incentive and the ability to do it and, you know, secure, you know, dry storage of the bicycle is really one of the, the gating issues, you know, the threshold issues for, you know, making that choice to, to, to have that commute, um, you know, by bike. And so, you know, whether that's interior to the unit or, you know, if, if you can't, if you can't squeeze it in, it would have to be some type of, you know, structure or something on the site, which which runs into the problem that I think Sean has kind of, you know, run into where, you know, there's there's all these, you know, different little things that you want to kind of elbow into the site and there's really, you know, not a ton of room. Um, so, you know, I would I would try to think very, very deliberately about that on the interior of these uh, these townhouse units. And if you can't do that, um, you, you're going to need to figure out something, um, you know, exterior to the units, maybe centralized for the whole project. Um, so, so that's all I have for now. Um, I did want to, you know, ask the team to kind of talk a little bit more about the, um, the fire access, but it does sound like, um, like they're continuing to work on that, which I think is a really important issue. Um, but I think that, you know, based on our conversations that we've had it is, I think an eminently solvable one with a good solution. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll continue to take a look at this stuff, but, but again, I, I would encourage you guys to look inside those townhouses and try to find some space. Thank you, Jim. That's uh, that's very very helpful, um, Mr. Connolly, Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I guess one thing I want to understand better that I, I didn't appreciate till the uh, presentation is the the rear of the townhouses in the grade. It, am I right? That's like an alley behind the units. Like, how does is it like a narrow corridor with a retaining wall that boxes it in? I, I'd just like to understand that. That's not how I sort of I understood it when I looked at the the plans before, but I might not have just gotten the three dimensions. There is a a small grade change between the the kind of base of the the elevation of the patio and then the existing grade next to it. There is a small retaining wall um, that's a few feet tall that runs along the 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 width of the of the rear there. Um, but it's not an alleyway in the sense that there's access behind it. Like each patio is a separate. Um, entity that's separated by um, landscaping to kind of create some privacy between each unit. And so how how wide is it between the retaining wall and the unit? The patios themselves, between the retaining wall and the unit, uh, I believe it's about eight feet. Um, they're kind of a, a fairly standard uh, uh, depth for, for like a deck or a patio like that. Ample space to kind of swing the door open and have like a small seating area or grill back there. Yeah, I'm just, I, there was one, I think, uh, like section of the elevation. It, it, so is it like a retaining wall that runs up the side boundary of the prop of the property? And is it, do we know, is it, you know, how tall is it? Um, is it exactly three feet the whole way? Uh, I can bring up the, um, the grading plan. We can, we can see the exact, uh, because we only have the one section, the one spot. So let me. Um, you want me to speak to that, Tim? I could. Uh, sure. Yeah. If you want to speak to that, yeah. Because the, yeah. the section I was showing there was more. Um, it was kind of kind of that one spot, so you you can see uh, the. I, I yeah, so, here. Yeah. So again, Paul Maddows with Allen Major Associates. The retaining wall behind units, the townhouse units one through six, very closest to uh, Brush Hill Road, being only two feet high. And then as you get closer to the, the next townhouse building, it gets to approximately four feet high there. And then behind townhouse units seven to 12, it starts at around four feet tall and it gets to uh, six feet tall at the highest point where it's uh, top of walls at 62. And then it goes back down to a four and a half feet at that corner where elevation 58 is shown on the plan there. And, and what is it? Is it exactly eight feet that's between the retaining wall and the unit? I don't have that dimension off the top of my head. Looking at the plan, I want to say it's, it's just over six and a half feet or so, but I don't have that dimension exactly. We'll have to look into that. Uh, it's six and a half feet by 12 feet. Okay. So you have like one area where it's a six and a half feet out and then a six foot wall you'd be looking at? Correct. 
I mean, is there another solution that's less tight than that? We'll have to uh, evaluate that. We can explore that. And then um, I, I know this was raised last meeting and I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to make the group site visit, but the the con and I, I I guess I'm I may know the answer from looking at the plans, but I think it's pointed out there's there's nowhere here for for children to play on the site. And is there, is there gonna be an accommodation or is the answer that there will be nothing provided on the site? Uh, we can we can look at how we're landscaping it and where we're siting. We can we can look at creating um, some more space between uh, some of the buildings and what we can get for a for a, a small play area. Uh, so that's something we can look at as we as we. Yeah, I think one thing I heard at the last meeting, I think described as an attribute was the access to Kelly Field, but that's that's a, a detriment. I think the nearest park being a mile away with some you know. Uh, streets that are really not safe for children to be crossing unattended. So I, I think that's a important point to to consider in the design. Um, and then I guess okay. So the the gate, if I understood the you right, I think you're suggesting that the fire chief. I think you said the fire chief does not want a gate, and that's being studied, but is a likely outcome. So if that's the case and there's no gate, then the prior discussion on traffic all coming in out of Amor Road is probably not the case, right? It'll be, people will be drawn to come in off the main street. So the idea, the, what's currently in discussion is instead of the gated access, this would be one way. Um, and I believe whether or not, uh, do you want to speak to this a little bit, Paul, but whether or not it's in or out, I think is still uh, under consideration. Yeah, so basically what we're going to looking at doing is narrowing that driveway entrance from uh, 24 feet or 20 feet to uh, probably something around 16 feet wide. And it's going to have a, a wider sweep either coming in or going out to limited traffic in the one way direction. So it definitely it's not, we won't have the gate there, but it's going to restrict. We're going to narrow that down to restrict uh, the flow patterns there. Okay. Um. Okay, that's all I have for now. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, Giselle, uh, do you have any questions of uh, any of the witnesses? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. My questions are around um, also the recreational space and, and walkability. So I guess first a comment, my kids go to Tucker Elementary and, and they do have a, a sort of a nice structure there. It's not really a park, and, a, and I say this as a mom, there's like one bench maybe for people to sit on. So it really is like a structure for kids to play on at recess and go back into their class. So I don't know if it's realistic that people are gonna be walking 0 0.7 miles. The sidewalks on Brush Hill Road and Brook Road, some of them are a little overgrown. It's just not that walkable. Um, certainly not with a toddler or a stroller. And um, to Brian's point, like crossing Blue Hill Avenue to get to sort of the second part of Oak Street there to get to the, the playground um, is not something that kids could do on their own. And frankly, without the crossing guard even, I think, I think it's a challenge for adults um, because of how busy that street is. So it, it just seems like a quick answer that as like, a parent who knows the area pretty well just doesn't seem like a, a realistic option that will play out, um, at least for, for many families. So I guess I'd, I'd ask whether you've looked at those things, I guess is the question, um, whether you have a response to any of that. Um, yeah, so like I said previously, um, I think just the general amenities that Milton provides is one of the, the reasons the site was selected. Uh, but in terms of kind of creating a, a, an on-site uh, uh, point for that, to kind of without having to um, travel to, to kind of one of those menu spaces, we, that's something that we looked at the beginning um, and kind of took a more, we, we didn't want a large consolidated building that fell out of place with the, the rest of the, we didn't want to mass everything into one larger building that kind of fell out of place with the rest of the, the height and, and 
footprint of the of the neighborhood, both on Amber Road and kind of toward the denser areas uh, to the to the zoning district. So that's kind of more to the northeast. Um, so we kind of uh, spaced everything out on the site with a kind of series of smaller spaces. But that's something we can look at again in terms of um, kind of creating a um, finding that balance to kind of with these outdoor spaces that are usable on the site, in addition to kind of keeping the keeping that the, the overall scale of the buildings down. Right. So something we can we can continue to explore. Yeah, I think that's important to consider. And then also along the lines of walkability, you showed the route to the bus on Amor Road. Is there a sidewalk on the other side of Amor Road? Like when if you're walking to the bus, is there a sidewalk to walk to, on? Neither side of there isn't a sidewalk on Amor on either side of the road. Um, there is a crossing at the at, once you get to Blue Hill uh, that to, to access both inbound and outbound signs of the of the bus stop, uh, but. The Amber Road isn't a, a, a super high vehicle uh, travel area, so and it's fairly wide for the amount of traffic this get. It is a very suburban road for for the city, um, so, so I believe it is it is fairly walkable. Yeah, I'm just thinking snowy day. I just don't know how that works again with the sort of a stroller or a toddler <laughs> experiences close to my own heart. So I I don't know. It's just, I guess also sort of more of a comment. But if you, I, I don't know that there's anything to be done about that, but I think it does sort of reflect on general accessibility and um, transportation options. Thank you. That's all from me. Okay, thanks, Giselle. Uh, Mr. Corcoran, do you have any questions of any of the witnesses this evening? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so when I think of a site like this, I in a site that wants to have young families with young children. I think of bikes and balls. Where do they play? And I raised this issue before. Where do kids under the age of 10 play safely? Can't just let them go out to the backyard and play safely. There's no place to play on this site. And it's un it is and it is completely unacceptable to think that kids under the age of 10 would find their way up to Tucker School or over to Kelly School to have outside play area. It's an equity position uh, situation. All of the houses in the neighborhood, whether on Amar Road or otherwise, have their own yards. They have places where kids can play. Parents can send young kids outside to play and know they'll be safe. There's no place to play here. They're going to play in the parking lot, and balls are going to run down the hill into Brush Hill Road. Bicycles are going to go down the hill into, into Brush Hill Road. It's unsafe. There's too much density on this property. Cut it in half, create some meaningful green space, and come back. Ama Road is also narrow. It doesn't have sidewalks on either side. It's nice that they're proposing a new sidewalk on the frontage of Amar Road, but that's going to narrow Amar Road. And it's an unsafe intersection at Truman Highway, um, Brush Hill Road, and Amor Road. You have now going to have less room for cars in each direction. And cars coming in off of, at high speed off of Truman Parkway, turning right or left and into Amor Road. Third comment is there's inadequate parking. You're going to have lots of families. They're going to have lots of visitors. There's no place within the site for visitors to park, which means they're gonna park on Amor Road, which means that the narrowness of, it, of Amor Road is gonna be exacerbated. I think uh, Mr. Reardon's comment that there's no, there's no sidewalk from uh, Amor Road into the property is important because people who are visiting need a safe access into the site if they're parking uh, without the site. Um, so I think those are a number of significant uh, concerns that we have as a butters that layer on top of the concerns that I've heard from members of the board and from Mr. Reardon. Um, I was pleased to hear um, the note, the, the fa fact that the trees offsite were, were surveyed. I would just ask whether the tree preservation plan um, applies to them. 
um, because it appears that the tree preservation plan applies to the trees that are on the lower lower level of the site on site, but it's not clear that the tree preservation plan applies to those trees that are off site and their root balls extend into the property. Uh, and there's a significant um, opportunity for them to be damaged and destroyed with the installation of retaining walls uh, and the like. So I would just ask whether um, the, um, uh, the whether the tree preservation plan applies to the trees that were surveyed that were within the 20 foot um, setback. And those are my substance of my comments for this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Corker. And uh, Mr. Uh, Schomer or Mr. Uh... Warringer, do you, uh, do you have any uh, comments uh, regarding Mr. Corcoran's uh, questions? I would defer to, to Natalie to answer the, the, I, the one question I heard was, will the trees, are the trees covered by the tree protection plan? I didn't hear any other questions from Attorney Corcoran. Um, so I would, I would ask Natalie if she has an yeah. answer to that one. Yes, this is Natalie Adams from Ferdinand Landscape Architecture. Um, there was another uh, issue that I think we spoke, we, we talked about before where we're proposing a sidewalk on Amor Road. We're not, um, we're not going in and taking any of Amor Road in order to put that sidewalk in. So that sidewalk is from the existing curb cut back. And um, so there was that point. Um, and then the, the, the trees you asked me to survey, you asked me to survey the trees outside the property line just to see what was there. You weren't asking us to preserve them. That was my understanding. Um, if I misunderstood you, um, we, can, we can explore that, but um, um, that's, uh, we went out and so now we know where these trees are that may be impacted. Um, um, I think the ones um, on Amur, adjacent to our Amur abutter, um, I don't believe there's any walls going in there. There's a, a road, so I don't think it's going to be really aggressive right there. Where they're going to be aggressive is um, there are uh, the retaining walls in the back, the one, there's one point where there's a there's a retaining wall that's about six feet height. And, and so that may impact the roots, but you're only impacting the roots along one zone. It's not like we're, we're encroaching on and around the whole tree, you know, the whole tree's critical root zone. It's only a partial cr critical root zone to the tree. So, um, you know, we'll look into that and explore that. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, you know, um, the site walk was, uh, you know, the site walk we took with the neighbors and the concerned citizens was, um, was, you know, we listened to a lot of their issues and problems and, um, and it, it was, and I really enjoyed speaking with them and I wanted everybody to know that. Thank you. Great. So, thank you and Mr. Chair, uh, if I might just uh, piggyback a little bit onto Natalie's answer there. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you? We know who you are, but why don't you introduce yourself just for the record for so we'll have us. Sure. So this is Joe Tamposi, um, Comprehensive Land Holdings, the owner and developer of the property. Uh, so just to piggyback on Natalie's answer, um, you know, we certainly did survey the trees outside the property line um, and noted primarily the trees, you know, that were closest to the property line. And what you can see on the graphic that's being shared on the screen, those circles around the trees actually represent you know, the critical root zones. And as Natalie pointed out, the, the primary tree protection zones are those two trees um, along Brush Hill Road, because those are the areas where the critical root zone extends far into our property. Um, if you're looking at this graphic, you can see, you know, just a very small sliver of the circles um, on the northern side actually extend over the property line. And of course, you know, there'll be no activity uh, from our project going over the property line. So, you know, 70, 80, 90% of that critical root zone on those trees is already being protected simply by being off our property. And then as Natalie also pointed out for those trees along Amor Road, um, you know, again, there's, you know, a, a larger proportion of that root zone, but still, you know, well less than half of the critical root zone extends onto our property. And in that area, there is much less grading and activity generally going on. So, you know, we can look into, you know, additional protections in that area, um, but, you know, just based on the sort of percentage of the critical root zone that's that's on our property, 
uh, you know, we feel that, uh, you know, they're going to be adequately protected and we can certainly look into additional measures such as irrigation or, you know, additional fencing to make sure that those, uh, you know, stay protected. Great. Thank you, Mr. Tamposi. Appreciate it very much. Um, I would, Mr. Chair, I would just like to clarify that the preservation of those trees is a significant issue for the two abutters. Okay, thanks, Ned. We, we, uh, I think we understood that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just have one, uh, one question, and it, it really hasn't been brought up, and I don't know how serious it is, but I can remember when we were walking the property, particularly when you get into that central portion of the property and going north uh, towards the property line there, there seemed to be uh, large outcroppings of ledge. Uh, and one of the questions that uh, several of the neighbors asked was, uh, are you going to work around that ledge uh, or are you going to blast and remove the ledge? And I, I was wondering, Mr. Lawringer, if you could just talk in a general sense as to uh, the extent of the ledge on the property, uh, about where it is, uh, to kind of describe the, uh, the length or depth of the ledge and uh, how that would, uh, how you intend to deal with the ledge issue as part of the construction process and uh, what, uh, what effect that would have on the neighbors, what type of protections you'd introduce into the construction process for the removal of the ledge to protect neighboring properties, just in a, in a very general sense. I can probably uh, address that one, um, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, that, that, that may be, I'll, I'll maybe ask Paul Matos to to provide backup. That's not, but, that's not. <laughs> um, so basically, it, the the short version is: if there is any blasting that's required, the state fire code has a specific procedure that must be followed, and it requires uh, pre-blast surveys be performed of all properties. I believe within a hundred feet of the blasting, uh, it it requires prior notice to all of the affected neighbors and and essentially what has to happen is uh, the developer has to to pay for and conduct a survey of their property to ensure that the the state of this of the properties are documented before any blasting takes place so that they have a basis to ascertain whether any blasting that takes place has caused any damage to their property uh, blasting is something that's it's very finely controlled and um, I, I think that it's a it's a word that when when people hear it they justifiably have cause for concern that um, essentially that we're, we're going to be back there with uh, sticks of dynamite of something off of Looney Tunes or something like that but that's that's not what it is at all it's very well controlled it's managed uh, and there's there are warnings when before blasting occurs um, that all having been said, I think it's not yet determined for this site whether blasting will be necessary because it's it's not currently clear the extent of the uh, the ledge on the site. And one of the recommendations, I believe, um, from Mr. Reardon's report was that we conduct additional test pits around the site to determine whether that is in fact ledge or or just uh, outcroppings of rock that are that are on the site. Um, Paul uh, Matos, could you could you uh, provide any further information that I maybe didn't cover there? Yeah, I will just uh, add to this that uh, on March 2nd and March 4th, we were out there and we conducted four additional test pits. Uh, those test pits were located in between the proposed drainage systems uh, on the northerly side, so closest to the ledge outcrops. Uh, basically, if you ran a line from the existing shed that's there out to Brush Hill, is the line site, site of line that we use to uh, stay, to do the test pits, and those test pits were excavated down anywhere from uh, nine and a half feet to twelve feet in depth, and we did not hit any ledge on any of the four test pits that we did. Uh, we also did a test pit that was closest to Brush Hill by the existing uh, rock outcrop that was there, uh, probably like five and a half feet away from that, and we were down uh, nine and a half feet there and did not hit any ledge there either. And can you draw some preliminary conclusions from those uh, test pit results? Uh, the material was consistent with what was originally submitted on the original plans. Uh, the material consisted of a loamy sand, so the stuff is consistent. And uh, that's basically it. So does yeah. that mean you don't anticipate ledge being a significant issue 
during the planning and construction process? Ledge would not be an issue with the installation of the drainage system. Ledge may be an issue with the construction of townhouse units seven through 12, because that's where the major outcrop is there in the field today. So there may be an issue with ledge there, but where the drainage system is between the six test pits that we have on site, we did not hit any ledge. Okay. Mr. Leonard, I'd be, I'd be real careful with that statement. Ledge is very random. So the mere idea that you don't see it in one test pit doesn't mean it's not 15 feet away, particularly when you see it outcropping on the site and there's no mapping of where it goes once it goes below the ground. What we've asked is for them to develop a better understanding of the limits of the ledge, not just to do additional test pits that you know sort of confirm what they already know. Let, let me ask you if I if if I could, Mr. Redden, uh, do do some uh, contractors under these circumstances perform some type of ultrasonic testing of the of the site to, to determine the boundaries and extent of the ledge, or is of the test pits the better way to ascertain what the issue is? It's a combination of things. What we would typically do is if we saw a ledge outcrop, you know, it could be one of two things. It could be it could be what's called the glacial erratic, which is just a big giant rock that just got dropped where it is and, and that's all it is. And that would frankly answer the questions about, you know, why it sits where it does and why we're getting the information we get in the test bits that looks different. Um, so so you'd, you'd scrape around the, the what you see and try to map it as it goes below the ground. And then I, I would have I would have expected that as part of the project they would have at least done some geotechnical borings or some borings to help them design the foundation systems for these buildings that would have you know it just would have been a drilled hole that would have been advanced down to refusal, which is in in this case would be ledge. So you know it, it was, what I'm uncomfortable with is that they're doing test pits that go down nine to twelve feet, but it it could be at thirteen feet where the ledge is. So. Um, you know, we really need to know where, what happens to that rock when it goes below ground. Okay. And so that's uh, the subject of further study, I guess. I would hope so. Okay. And let me, let me just ask one more question, uh, Mr. Shoma, to you, uh, just for the sake of the concerns of the neighbors. Uh, I, I assume when any construction project like this uh, is taking place where there's ledge being present, in addition to the surveys of the subject property, the surveys of the neighboring properties, uh, the uh, the owner here of the property, uh, as well as any of the uh, contractors uh, dealing with the ledge issue, uh, would have in full force and effect substantial liability insurance policies to protect the neighbor's interests in the event that they have uh, claims of possible damage. Is that is that true? That's true, and, and that's also required by the fire code. Okay, great, great. Then I, I don't uh, have any uh, uh, further questions. Uh, let me ask uh, Crystal. Uh, Crystal, is there any individual out there who has their hand up that uh, wants to ask any questions of uh, of any of the expert witnesses who testified? Sure, I do not see anybody right now with their hand up. Um, would any of the attendees like to say anything? I know there's only a few people there. Okay, no, that, that's all right. I just want to be um, sure. Who do we have? Um, Sandra? Hi. Hi, Hi. I'm Ms. De Silva. Why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Sandra De Silva, and I live on Amar Road. Oh, good. Welcome, welcome to the Board of Appeals. Thank you. What, what um, questions do you have and to whom? Well, my concern is visitors parking. Um, currently um, at 16 Amor Road, it's one house and I'll see several people parked on the lot. And even during the site visit, um, people were parked on one of my neighbor's lawn um, that's a little concerning because if there's one family at 16 Amor Road and so many people are parked on their lawn, and then during the site visit, people are parked on my neighbor's, um, on, on her lawn, my concern is where's everybody going to park? 
the visitors. If you go down there, you'll see people parked on the lawn all the time. And like I said, during the site visit, people were parked on one of my neighbor's lawn. I was just like, wow. And we don't even have two units, but they're proposing 16. Okay, that, that's a great question. Mr. Lawrence, should you want to address uh, Mrs. De Silva's uh, concerns about uh, parking for the 16 units? And for more, more importantly, for visitors who are uh, uh, coming to the uh, project to either meet with or uh, uh, visit with the people and then perhaps also for holiday types of celebrations and uh, family get togethers. I can maybe handle that one, uh, Mr. Oh. Chair. Um, yeah. So the, the project is, has been designed with 31 parking spaces, which is just one space short of two per unit. Uh, which, as I as I recall, is the requirement for uh, single-family dwellings in Milton. Um, the way that parking is is calculated for developments like this is you it, you're, you don't break out spaces for residents and guests. They're all considered in in the same pool, as it were. Um, and the reason for that is because every unit will be different in terms of who's living there and, and how many vehicles they have. One person may have one vehicle, another person may have two vehicles, and it all it, it's it's difficult to to determine who that will be because different people will reside in these units and there'll be rentals, so they uh, they may be living there for two years at a time, five years at a time, ten years, and it's it's just hard to determine. Um, so basically, when we design projects like this, what we are shooting for in 40B projects and the statewide average, I would say, roughly speaking, you're shooting for from a developer's perspective, approximately one and a half spaces per, per unit. And in this project, as I mentioned, we're just short of two spaces per unit. Uh, so this is, I would say, compared to, to the typical 40B project, this compares quite favorably in, in providing a significant amount of parking on the site. And, and part of the way that we determine that is the traffic engineers, they, they consult the uh, Institute of Traffic Engineers guide uh, for for determining the the um, projected parking demand uh, for this site. So what I will do uh, is I'll commit to speaking with our traffic engineer after this hearing and having him provide additional information about the question of parking demand uh, for this site based on the proposed use and the location in in in, in Milton. Um, and just to further add, um, I, I think that um, we're hearing a lot of a, a lot of feedback from from the town and from the neighbors that there needs to be a commitment to uh, alternative forms of transport, uh, particularly bike transport, to get to uh, to ra uh, rapid transit, and and we are committed to that as well. I think it's an important uh, aspect of this project, and I think uh, Tim Zerwinski's comments about uh, providing uh, well thought thought out uh, accommodations for for commuter. Uh, bicycle storage is is um, it's it's very well uh, very well made and, and heard on our part. So uh, I'll commit to to following up with more information when we when we go into the traffic uh, presentation uh, at a future date. Great, that would be appreciated. Let me just ask you a, a curious question. Pops into my mind: Is there any uh, additional parking available at the Tucker School on weekends and holidays? Is is there a do they allow the public to park at the school area or is that basically uh, not permitted? I, I don't know the answer to that, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's something I, uh, I'll i put on my, my list of homework assignments to look into and, and try to provide an answer for you. Yeah, particularly for holidays, it may be an interesting uh, circumstance if you could if you could park there and that it would may resolve a lot of uh, serious issues, but uh, so and I, I thank you for committing to talk to the traffic engineer. That's certainly very uh, helpful. Crystal, is there any other uh, member of the public uh, who has yeah. a question? Yes, there's one more. Um, I'm not. It's it's an email address. Vesper. Not. Oh, I think yes. That's yes. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening. Um, Vesper Barnes here. So. Um, thanks for taking my uh, taking me on to speak. Um, Ned's you know, representing. Sorry, you live on Emo Road. 
Yes, I live oh, on right. Amos Road. As a matter of fact, I live right across from where the site is, um, diagonally across from where the site's being planned. Good. And I have several concerns with regards to the excess traffic, but I think that's been um, addressed as well as the lack of any um, place, place, place for the children to play over there. But my concern is the, the landscaping that's been proposed. It seems to me that what's being planned is to remove all the trees that are the um, buffer between the various um, homes that are here. So across the street from me, there's a beautiful spread of trees that bloom in the spring, um, become beautiful foliage in the summer, and turn into amazing uh, foliage in the fall. And it seems that um, I heard the developers say that their plan is to not impact the trees that are not on their side of the property. But if you come to the site and walk the site, what you realize is that in fact, most of those trees are on their side of the property. And my concern is, are any of those trees historical trees? Are any of those trees, trees that we need to think about saving? Because I, I, I don't have any problem with a reasonable size project going over there, but from all that I've heard, my question is, what is their plan to preserve the beauty and the, the charm of the neighborhood so that the people that are moving to Milton can really get what they're coming for? They're coming for a, a, a community that has a lot of beauty, a lot of grace. They just don't want to um, come to Milton and find that they're in some sort of, a, you know, second class, um, you know, development where we're over here across the street with our children, um, where they have their own place to play. We have a beautiful yard. We have our houses surrounded by trees and they're stuck across the street with high density and their children have no place to play. It seems like an inequitable situation uh, all around. And so I don't have an issue with um, something being developed, but it seems to me it has to be reasonable as to size and scale. Okay, great. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, Ms. Adams, do you want to uh, generally uh, address uh, um, Mr. Sure. Uh, yes, concerns? Yes, be happy to. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Ms. Barnes, for your comments. Um, I think it's very hard to uh, for a neighborhood to change. And, um, you know, as a landscape architect working with developers, we run into um, this problem every time there's change and people don't want to see it. And I understand that you look out your front window across the street and you see these beautiful trees um, and you admire them. But um, we are also proposing some uh, really lovely um, trees for that area and shrubs, as well as the architecture itself. I mean, you saw Tim's presentation and those uh, those four dwellings along Emmer Road were, they're, they're just really sweet. And, um, but, and I understand everything you're saying about the, uh, the, you know, that you have these, you, you know, your neighbors have all these large you know, lawns and their play structures are outside. And then there's this development that, that appears a little tight, but um, um, we are going to, um, you know, we're going to explore explore all the comments that we've received tonight, and and we thank you for them all. Thank you. Okay, great. Th thank you very much. And perhaps when you get more definitive plans, you could send Ms. Bonds a, a copy of your drawings and plans, and that she may uh, enjoy looking at them and commenting. Uh, Crystal, is there any uh, other uh, person out there who has their hand up? I don't see anybody right now, no. Okay, great. So uh, let me go back to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Schomer. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, being witnesses there. I think this has been uh, productive and very, very helpful. I, I think our next uh, continuance date goes over to Wednesday, April 6th at, uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, uh, let me ask you two questions. Number one, do you have anything further to add uh, at this particular hearing? And number two, um, could you give us just a brief outline as to whom you are going to be proposing um, on uh, April 7th? I'm sorry, April 6th. That's a Wednesday at 7, at 7 p.m. Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a, a couple of additions from me. Um, 
I'm, I'm advised, and, and perhaps Mr. Tamposi could, could speak to this further, um, the, the additional test pits that Mr. Matos referred to, those will be filed with the board as soon as possible. I understand there was some visual observation of the, the stone on the site uh, that, that led uh, them to, to believe that that may have been, um, and, and forgive me, Sean, I, I don't remember the word you used, glacial. Uh, and there was erratic. another word. Sporadic, yes, thank you. Er, er, uh, erratic. Erratic, okay. Um, we will file that updated information with the board as soon as it's available. Right. Um, one of the, I think the, the main comments that we've heard both tonight and at the previous hearing have to do with on-site uh, programmed recreation space. Um, that's something that we'll need to, to look into. In, in my experience with projects of this size, it's, it's not typical to have programmed on-site active recreation space, like a, a tot lot or something of that nature. Uh, just because it's it's a significantly smaller project than, and, and I know that that it, it doesn't seem small to the neighbors, uh, but in terms of the number of units and the number of prospective residents for the site, it's significantly smaller than something, uh, for example, like uh, 582 Blue Hill Avenue, which had uh, more than four times the number of units. So with with a project, when you get to that scale, you you know that you're you're probably uh, going to have at least you know 20 30 children on the site and, and in that case it, it may make sense to to build out a playground or something like that but with a project like this where you're talking about 16 units you may have two children or four children or six children and you may not know what age those children may be you may have six high school children in which case a tot lot uh, may just sit there uh, and and not get any use uh, on, on a site like this uh, so that having been said, uh, we'll we'll study that and, and look into it and, and and provide some more information in terms of feasibility and, and whether it makes sense to explore that as a possibility. And um, just following up on that, we'll be interested to see uh, what Mr. Bomer's comments are uh, with respect to the site. So I see uh, Judy Barrett has has joined us, and I wonder if, if she has any uh, sense of whether Cliff will be filing a report at some point for this project. That's my understanding, Attorney Schomer. Um, I'll I'll follow up with him tomorrow. I know he's out of the country right now. Yeah. So, but I'll I'll follow up. I can certainly send him a text message, and I'll eventually hear back from him. Okay. We understand, we understand he's in Rome, Judy. Yes, sir. He is. Yep. Uh, so, in terms of your question, Mr. Chair, for the next hearing on April sixth, uh, my suggestion would be that we focus on uh, civil. Um, the civil details in the stormwater management system. Um, e either that, or, or we could we could shift over to traffic. Perhaps um, perhaps the board is is interested in that. Um, I, I leave that to the pleasure of the board. We'll, we'll, we can be prepared to address either, whichever you you feel is a higher priority to get get well, into the record. It, it makes no difference to me. I think wanted to check with your experts as to their availability and and scheduling, and we can accommodate them. So we'll. Uh, we'll have everyone uh, have sufficient time to be prepared and uh, provide the testimony that we need. So okay. we can, uh, why don't you just uh, shoot us an email at some point in time when you get your uh, uh, proposed witnesses so we'll know exactly who's going to be testifying and when. Well, as I'm as I'm sitting here thinking as we're as we're talking, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm I'm actually going to change my mind and suggest that we we go to traffic next, if that's acceptable to the board. Um, I think that from what we've been talking about tonight, it sounds like uh, Mr. Reardon and, and the fire chief may may want us to to make some modifications to the site, uh, and we're, and and going back to the issue of of possible uh, on-site recreation space that may uh, lead to a change as well. Uh, the traffic study would not be impacted by that. Um, so my suggestion would be that we 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 move to traffic and the traffic study. Specifically, and that the witness for that would be uh, either Bob Michaud or Dan Dume, uh, both from MDM Transportation, and I'm sure uh, one or the other of them would be available for the April 6th meeting. Okay, that's uh, that. That sounds sensible to me, Judy. Let me ask you something that uh, that I, I don't see. I haven't seen a peer traffic review. Have have we have one filed yet? By the, by the applicant or by the um, consultant? By the, by the consultant. Our town, don't, don't we normally have a peer review on, on traffic issues? 
It is in uh, Sean Meriden's scope, I believe. And so okay, it's, it's at the end of my my current letter. Okay, all right. Uh, which you filed last week? I think so. They're all oh, no, the, the strange <laughs> part of it. I'll, I'll confess that uh, I, I don't have a letter from you in my file. So if you, yeah. if you filed a peer review report, yeah, at least it didn't come to me. Uh, maybe it came to the other board members, or maybe it just got put into, uh, or maybe I missed it, but I just. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think my letter was on the 17th, and it in the, the very end section was on traffic. So we had our traffic um, consultants review the report that was submitted by the applicant visit the site. I mean, safe to assume that the, the functioning intersection, that the, the Amor Road, Brush Hill Road, and the Truman Parkway intersection is a, a very unique situation in terms of the way it's organized and the way it's arranged. And any kind of new driveways into it are going to be complicated. Okay, so well, we, have, we have two peer reviewers yeah. there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, can I just, can I just uh, ask uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, the if the if there's ongoing discussion about the the entrance on uh yeah where we're going to replace the gate and modify access does this give enough time to come to a solution and update the study and have a productive meeting on April 6th yeah i think so because what it can do is it can sort of it, it can provide some of the information to have sort of a more educated viewpoint of the driveway okay so i i think i think it's good foundational discussion um, and then you also sort of put to bed some issues that may be out there that could get resolved quickly. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it's definitely beneficial for the board to hear some of the background information. Okay, that's great. And then I just do want to respond as to one uh, of the comments Attorney Schoenmer made. I don't think the board or others were suggesting any particular solution to the recreational space, like a top structure or otherwise, I, I, uh, even yards. Um, provide recreational space um, for kids of all ages. And so I think all things like that should be considered. You know, the, 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 the density proposed has been the developer's choice, but that's, there are solutions there as well. Understood, thank you for that. No, thank you, Brian. Uh, so do you have any anything further, Brian? Uh, no, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Giselle, uh, are you content? Do you have anything you want to add to the hearing tonight? Nothing further for me. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Great. And uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ned, are you, do you have anything further you want to add? No, I don't. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, great. And uh, Mr. Schomer, uh, are we all set to adjourn until uh, the 6th of uh, April at uh, 7 p.m.? I think we are. Thank you very much. We appreciate okay. your time. Great. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the hearing. And uh, Look forward to seeing you on uh, Wednesday, April 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, where we'll hear, hear traffic and we'll either civil or uh, stormwater management issues. Have a great evening, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you on the 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, Crystal. Appreciate it. Thank your... you. I appreciate your help.